Now, I know, Dad, the best three years that you spent in high school were grade 11. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, they were. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, I'd like to tell you about my dear late father-in-law. When I first met Ross, he was in the prime of his life. He was a lion of a man. Charismatic, courageous, complex, and feared by some, admired by many. Ross grew up in Barrie in the 20s and also through the 30s, the Depression years. Uh, his family was uh, have modest means but dignified, churchgoers and uh, law-abiding citizens. They kept chickens in their backyard as most people did in those days and uh, Ross attended the local high school where he famously says he spent his best f three years were grade 11. <laughs> What do you attribute your great academic success to in your early years? Well, I used to go hunting every Friday afternoon. I would go hunting. In his high school years, he rode a motorcycle, played hockey, played football, all of course without a helmet. Ross looked at the outbreak of the Second World War as an opportunity to get out of Barrie. So he lit out for Toronto and enlisted with not the Royal Canadian Air Force, but the Royal Air Force, where he was assigned to the Ferry Command. Imagine the young boy who hadn't even finished high school leaving Barrie and being responsible for delivering several thousand tons of steel from Dorval in Detroit across the ocean to the theaters of war. I decided I didn't want to go in the walking army. <laughs> I wanted to fly. You know, it was a, a great thing and gave me a chance to see the world and save my bacon. I was just a snotty-nosed kid until I went into the forces. As a navigator, Ross was solely responsible for the safety and safe passage of his crew, uh, who were his good friends, of course, without benefit of GPS, using only the stars and his famous mathematical skills, a few instruments, and Morse code. The Ferry Command used two main routes, the northern route, uh, taking the planes from Detroit, where they were built, to Dorval, and then north through Gander, Newfoundland, Greenland, Iceland, and then Scotland and into England, or the southern route from Detroit down through Bermuda, uh, Belize, Rio de Janeiro, across the uh, southern Atlantic Ocean to the Ascension Islands, Gibraltar, Cairo, Karachi uh, to deliver their planes. It may have been on these transatlantic flights that Ross's famous entrepreneurial skills were born. And that's when you find out what life's all about. Education is power. Those are the things you learn and besides that you could engage in the black market, make yourself a thousand dollars a month easy. He uh, had a little import-export business going, so that if someone needed ballpoint pens in Rio de Janeiro, he could supply them, or nylon stockings in Cairo, he could supply them. We pick up uh, uh, rum and scotch in uh, Nassau and carry it on the aircraft with us to, uh, say, Ascension Island, which was American base where there was no liquor allowed. It's right up here. You buy it for a dollar a bottle, you'd sell it for eight or nine. This is all strictly against regulations, of course. And there was one famous time when Ross uh, told his family to be out on the lawn of their home in Barrie. I'm coming in Highway 90 down Dunlop Street, got her tipped over on her side and waving to the... <laughs> My folks down who had an electric light going on and off, and I look up and oh my God, there's the Catholic Church steeple right now. That's a good one. So I, I, I flipped her over the right hand bank and dumped all the the poor devils in the back and all their equipment. Who the hell am I back there? But we miss we miss the Catholic Church steeple. He had many special friendships, but one in particular was his friend Ray Garver, who was somewhat older than Ross, who had been married already a couple of times by the time they met. And they flew together almost invariably. It was kind of a good luck thing that they flew together. So 
in late 1944, Ray and Garver were fogged in in Cairo. They had some time on their hands, so they went to the bazaar. And we went out into the garden after dinner at night. The old soothsayer was there. And he said to Garver that he would be dead in six months. And he told me I'd live to be 88. And we sort of took it pretty late. Ross had not been able to spend any time with his family at Christmas time. It meant a lot to him. So in 1944, he did get some time off to go to Barrie and be with his family. And Garber said, well, I got nothing to go stay here for. He, was, I got, he was divorced at the time, third time. And he said, well, I'll go. Ross is enjoying his family Christmas. And his young sister, Audrey, who had a crush on Ray, woke up in the middle of the night and said, Ross, I think something's happened to Garver. Would you please call Dorval and see, you know, what's happened to him in his plane? The best guess is that he flew into one of these uh, major uh, cumulus clouds and there's vertical winds in those things at 70 to 80 mile an hour. And they just, if you flew into one at night, they just fold the wings and down you go. His plane was lost somewhere over the Amazon jungle and he was never heard from again. So the fortune teller's prediction came true within a few days of the six weeks. And you knew Garver, did you, Aunt Audrey? Oh, yes. And what was he like? He was a big hunk of man, as Betty says, and he loved the women. And I felt sorry for him because he, he'd been divorced three times. I don't know what his problem was, but he was a terrific guy. And my parents thought the world would. After the war, Ross returned to Canada and enrolled at Queen's University. He became a Queen's engineer. He was very proud to be part of Queen's engineers. I think it combined their raffish naughtiness with the, you know, their fine academic record. Ross's experiences in the war did change him. His love of history, his knowledge of geography, his assurance of being a citizen of the world were all forged in his experiences in the war. As he gazed on the pyramids of Giza, the temples of Luxor and Karnak, the Kasbahs of Marrakesh, Dunlop Street and Barry must have seemed very far away and somewhat insignificant. He brought back a perspective on matters of state, politics and the economy that was a world view, a global perspective. It's amazing the power of the wind. It sure is. He had a very successful career lived a long and happy life. He was convinced, as the fortune teller had told him, that he would live until he was 88, but sadly he passed away in his 87th year. Through family triumphs and family tragedies, he was the North Star. When you think of Ross, look up and think of him as the guiding light. <laughs>